Just over a year ago, we had the referendum in the United Kingdom whether we should... Let's start again. Just over a year ago, we had the referendum in Great Britain whether we should stay in the European Union or leave. And I was very much in favour of staying because I've long believed in the European project and that we should work together. So I got this blackboard and I got someone to write out this lovely request to the voters of the village vote remain on June the 23rd and we put it on the blackboard on the easel and put it in the front of the house. It looked absolutely beautiful. We took a photograph of it, sent it to the Financial Times and they would have liked to print it but they just didn't have room to fit it in. Sadly we lost the referendum. I think this may have disastrous long-term consequences for the country but we must move forward and perhaps there's something more we can do and look forward to something better. Not necessarily the politics of Europe, but understanding how the universe works. And to explain that, I need the blackboard and I need to erase this thing. So, goodbye Europe for the moment. I've just left V, perhaps that's V for some other victory. <laughs> but even that better go because we mustn't count any chickens before they're hatched. I want to talk about a really big problem which has been around in the foundations of physics for at least 150 years. And it's going to take me a little bit of time. I won't be able to explain the problem and I think the resolution to it in two minutes. All the known laws of nature are completely indifferent to the direction of time. They work in exactly the same way that you th think about time flowing. You get an example of this when two billiard balls collide you take a film of it, you run it backwards, it looks exactly the same. But why do we find so many processes that all clearly go in one direction? We're all getting older in the same direction. We never meet anyone getting younger. All the stars are getting older in the same direction as us. Where does this huge asymmetry in time come from, given that the underlying laws of nature are also symmetric in time? Now, I think that there is a possible resolution and I can illustrate it by the simplest non-trivial problem that comes out of Newton's theory of gravitation. Just three particles interacting with each other. In the distant past you can imagine this particle going through space coming along like that in a straight line in accordance with Newton's first law. So that's the story of the particle's movement and the direction of time. And then in the opposite direction towards that particle there's two particles coming towards it on a straight line to meet at their common centre of mass. Now I can't draw them both at once, I'd be a remarkable artist worthy of Picasso if I could do that, but I can draw one at a time. So I'll stop here when I get to the point where it meets the red one and I'll do the second particle that's coming in with it. They are interacting with each other and this one is going around, they're going around each other like this going round each other in a nice sort of waltz they're doing. They're going round like that. And when they get here, something happens. There's a swapping round. The yellow one keeps on going down here. But now, when we go down here, we see the yellow one has got paired up with the red one. There's been a swapping over like this. And the red one is now going down with the yellow one. That's the story you get there. And so let's put some arrows here. So this is the yellow one. This is the distant past and it's coming towards the other one. As time goes, they're coming together. And here's the blue one coming along with the yellow one. And here's the yellow one going down here and the red one with it. And then the blue one is now on its own and that is got set off and it's going off and now it goes off in a straight line like the red one. So that's the story and you can tell it this way that I told it there where time is passing, they're coming together 
they interact, there's a chaotic process where they all interact together and still time is passing. So that's one way you can say time is passing. But because the laws of nature are completely indifferent to the direction of time, you can do it in a different way. You can say what is happening really, forget those arrows, and now I can reverse the story and say what is really happening is that these two, they're coming together and then it goes out there. That's the flow of time you've watched with my hands. So that's an alternative story. And it's particularly strange if you think of this as a boy and a girl, the boy in blue and the girl in yellow, dancing a waltz. They come together and meet a solitary red boy. And when they get in this tangle together here, that red boy pinches the girl and goes off waltzing with her down that way. And the blue guy off, goes off all on his own, feeling very sorry for himself. That's the story told that way. You just reverse those arrows of time and now the blue boy is coming in and meets the dancing bear. He pinches the yellow girl and goes off with her and the red boy is now all on his own. So that just emphasizes how very mysterious this very fundamental law of nature is. There's a quite different way of looking at it. It's where you could say there are actually two stories all in this one picture. So there's one story which is this one and there's another story which is that one. So in this story, instead of saying that the red one is meeting the pair coming in in that direction, what is really happening is you start off with chaos. Forget about that altogether. There's a chaotic motion here. It's like primordial chaos. And out of that order begins to emerge. One particle separates off from the other two and goes off in a straight line that way. And this one gets into this pair of, of waltzing around each other. And as this happens, you can regard this pair as defining a clock, which is ticking, and it's saying that with respect to this rate of tick, this is going at a uniform speed. And it also defines a direction and a measuring rod, the length of the orbits. And all of that tells you this is obeying Newton's first law. And all of this emerges out of this chaos here. So that's one story. And then apparently a completely separate story, exactly the same thing is happening in that direction. And it's much more natural to define the direction of time by how structure and order forms. Normally, most people think that time is something like an invisible river, which is flowing just inexorably, and there's nothing you can do about it. But actually to say that we're getting older and like, like this, you compare photographs of yourself from a year ago with now, and then you see you have got a little bit older. We always have to base everything on what we can see and the concrete evidence we have. So I'm suggesting that actually we shouldn't see this as one history which can be told in two ways, but two histories which are not identical, but they're basically the same. And this we think is, could well be the resolution to this huge problem of the growth of structure and the growth of entropy, this mighty problem of the arrow of time. So that's our hope to sort that out in that way. So how many minutes was that? Seven. Seven. Oh well, yeah, we've got two off. Yeah, yeah. that went much yeah. better, didn't it? Yes.